Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. Uh, I want to apologize in advance. I'm a little froggy this morning. So I was not eating frog legs, even though they're very good. So that's a terrible dad joke. It's not even Father's Day yet. I'm kind of gearing up for it. Isaiah chapter 5. Okay. Uh, we're going to look at verse 20. It says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now, over in Proverbs 17, 15, it says, He who justifies the wicked and condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. God puts a lot of stock in honesty. He looks, puts a lot of stock in righteousness. And he does not, he does not tolerate wickedness. Um, it's important for us to understand that because many times we justify wickedness uh, in our own lives and in the lives of those that we love. We find ourselves... Many times when someone's going through a hard time uh, justifying the decisions that they make uh, because we have a relationship with them. And, and um, we're going to find out a little later on why that's not a good thing to do. We need to deal with, with sinfulness. We need to deal with, with unrighteousness because our eternal lives are at stake in these things. Now... Uh, we've talked about many times over the years uh, when you look at the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, it's a case of, of God's judgment against evil. And, and it wasn't the presence of evil that, that brought the judgment because God, when he's dealing with Abraham, Abraham said, well, what about if I find 50 righteous folk? Okay, well, you 50 find righteous folk, I'm not going to judge the place. Well, how, 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 about, how about 40? All right, well, 40. Well, he gets them down to 10. The problem was there wasn't 10 righteous people there. And it's not the presence of evil necessarily that brings judgment, even though it's a catalyst, but it's the absence of righteousness. And in our own nation, we need to understand the preserving influence that the body of Christ has on this nation. You need to understand the preserving influence you have against those who are around you. There are many times when people, I've heard people say over the years, well, why hasn't, you know, America gone down? Because there's more than 10 righteous folk here. God gets no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. The Bible says it's his desire that we repent and find life. Over in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33, it says, uh, be not deceived. Now, he tells us to be not deceived because this is an area where we become deceived in. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought to and stop sinning as some have no knowledge of God. And I, and I speak this to your shame. Now, many of us have lived long enough to remember a time where it was a given that if you were part of American society, you had a basic understanding of what the Bible said. Those days are gone. Not, not necessarily anything other than the fact that the body of Christ at one time used to be the center of society, but now They've taken a back seat to carnality and worldliness. And we find even in the body of Christ, there's a lot of things that are tolerated now that have not, were not tolerated years ago. And we used this example last week, and I'll use it again. Um, if our standard is God's Word, our, God's Word is always constant. It never changes. But if our standard of righteousness is to stay a cut above the world, as if we do that, as the world goes down, we go down with it. Now, 
over in Matthew chapter 5, let's take a look at that. You know, say, what, what, what has all this got to do with, with being memorials? Well, we're, we're going to get to that. In Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 13, he tells his disciples, he's saying this to us today, he says, you're the, the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? Well, the answer is it can't. It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill can't be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand that it gives light to all that are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see, see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. All right, let's, let's break this down a little bit. He tells us you, now you being the, the church, the body of Christ. We are the salt of the earth. We're the preserving factor in society. Now, if the church has allowed itself to lose its savor, okay, and we're that preserving influence through the preaching of the gospel, through the, uh, living uh, the gospel, there are people that can go into your workplace and they can use the name of the Lord in vain and everyone will laugh and they'll, or they won't even pay any attention to it. But as soon as you bring the word of the Lord out, they go, wait a minute. Why? Because your life matters. Even though at times they may mock you for your Christian faith, even though at times they might say, I don't believe any of this, I don't want to hear any of that, they hear you nonetheless. Your life is important. You're a preserving factor. But if the church loses its savor, the only thing it's good for after that, and, and understand something, this was actually a, a benefit, however small. They would throw it out in the street, and it would just kind of add to the road mix. And unfortunately, the body of Christ in many aspects of society is being walked on. And it's for no other reason than the fact that we've lost our savor. Okay. Now, he also tells us where to shine. Light, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. We are like a city set on a hill. You can't hide that. Even in a storm, you can still see some of it coming through. We're to shine in such a way, not necessarily so that people can say, oh, well, they're good folk. And I just tell people, there is no good folk in church. There's just folks who have received forgiveness, who love the Lord, and are doing their best to imitate Him. But our desire is to do good works, not necessarily so that people can say, well, what a good bunch of people that you are. But they would say, your God is real. He's real to you. And if he's real to you, maybe I should look into making him real for me as well. Now, that brings us to the point of our subject today, which is the best way of bringing attention to someone throughout history has been through memorials. Right? It's interesting that in the last couple years there has been a concerted effort in this nation to destroy and remove as many memorials as possible. And the, the old adage is true, if you don't learn from history, you are bound to repeat it. Now, a memorial is dedicated to someone who has, in this case, uh, we have Memorial Weekend. Uh, it's dedicated to someone who has died and to bring remembrance to them. Now, Memorial Day was originally called Decorations Day. And it was designed to honor those who died during the Civil War. Now, during that time, uh, it started in the North and the South kind of like, well, you know, you guys do your thing, we'll do ours. And they really didn't, uh, it wasn't a national, in fact, it wasn't a national holiday until 1971. Okay. And originally, the original idea was 
in the beginning of May, you'd have a time of remembrance, and they chose that because that's when flowers were best in bloom, and they'd go decorate the graves of the fallen with, with flowers. And then it kind of, over time, well, we're, we, we need to have a, a central day, and, and we're going to make it uh, the last Monday of May, and folks are like, well, no, that's not necessarily a good day, because if you do that, that's the start of summer, and it just, it's just going to turn into a long weekend, and no one's going to really remember what it's about anyhow. Glad that didn't happen. Oh, wait, it kind of has. It kind of has. But see, Memorial Day is, it was a time that was set aside to honor those who sacrificed for this country. Now, it originally it was for the Civil War, but it's gone to include all wars. And, and interesting enough, after World War I, the North and South kind of got together and said, you know what, we got we to gotta, we gotta be unified in this. And that's why you see um, uh, at your grocery stores and things, you'll see the American Legion, you'll see the VFW out there, and they'll have a little box out there with the little uh, red poppies, and, and I encourage you to avail yourself to that. Uh, the purpose for that is to raise funds for families who've had someone who's passed on, who's died. Um, it's interesting, uh, that particular, the red poppies is from came from a, a poem in, in World War I, written by, believe it or not, a, a Canadian army surgeon over in Belgium, uh, called, a poem called Flanders Field. And if you've never heard it, it goes something like this. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place in the sky, the lark still bravely singing Fly scars heard amidst the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunlight glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Field. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from falling, failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high, and if you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep though poppies grow in Flanders Field. And as he was doing his surgical duties, he looked out over this field, and in the midst of all the carnage and everything, their little red poppies were growing. Now, later on afterwards, uh, American got a hold of that, turned into uh, what we kind of have today, where they would sell the poppies, or a little, not really a poppy poppy, it's a little cloth type thing. Uh, to benefit the families of those um, who have passed on. You might go to a funeral, or not a funeral, I'm sorry, a memorial service uh, in a cemetery. You'll go maybe see some uh, tombstones, and they'll have little coins on it. Okay, I don't know if you guys have ever seen that before. All right, well, those coins are, are meaningful. If you have a tombstone with a penny on it, it means someone visited it has got a nickel on it, means that, that someone was there that went to boot camp with that person. If it's got a dime on it, it means that they were serving with them. And if there's a quarter on it, it means someone came by who was with them when they passed away. Okay. Now, I, I, I say all that because in our society, a lot of folks had no idea what this weekend's all about because it just hasn't been important, okay, for us as a nation. Now, for a lot of us sitting here today, it's very important to us, okay? Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of that importance is lost on younger generations unless they are told. Likewise, we have a heritage of godliness in this country that has been very much forgotten about of late. And it's important for those of us who know and who remember to share with those that don't. Because a lot of folks just go by through life. They hear about this thing called the gospel and they hear about this thing called righteousness and judgment. And, but they really don't understand what any of it's about. And that's where you and I come in. 
We are living memorials, okay? Um, not only do we bring remembrance to the fact that Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty of our sins, but he rose again, and he gives us justification for life. And he's coming back again, and he'll bring judgment to those who do good and those who do wickedness. Over in Colossians chapter 2, let's take a look at that. We're going to start in verse 8. It says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Now, we certainly see a lot of that going on today. There's a lot of folks who have a lot of different ideas about how life works, and how eternal life's going to work, and how church ought to work. But is it based on truth or just somebody's opinion? Uh, I've had folks over the years say, well, well, what's your opinion about this? And I, and I tell them, and it sounds, it sounds a little harsher than I mean it, but I tell them, you know, my opinion's like yours. It doesn't mean anything. What does the Word of God say about this? That's what's important. Okay. That is what is important. For in him, meaning Christ, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you've been made complete. He is the head over all rule and authority. Everything you need to be complete is found in Christ, in your relationship. He is the head over all rule and authority. You know, I, this is a subject for another day, but I'm, I'm going to throw it out here anyhow. That means he has the right to say what we do and don't do. That's what authority means. Authority means you have the right to say how things are done. So when he gives us his word, it's not, it's not a suggestion, it's a commandment. He said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. My commandments aren't grievous. His commandments are what gives us life. And yet we find ourselves many times straying from the commandments to the traditions of folks, traditions of society, traditions of our own opinion. All right, where was I? This. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, thank God for that, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. And if that doesn't make you appreciative, I don't know what will. Amen. He has forgiven us of all our transgressions. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of degrees against us, which was hostile to us, he's taken it out of the way, having it nailed it to the cross. There was a, a charge against you and I that was true. And he said, you know what? I'm going to take that charge. I'm going to take that legal document that calls for your judgment. I'm going to nail it to the cross, and then I'm going to cover it with my own blood. So when God looks at it, he says, you know what, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't read that. It's, it's kind of covered with blood. Can't quite make that out. And he forgives us. And when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. He has triumphed over the enemy. See, the world's idea of dealing with sin is to accept it and tolerate it and hope that someday it gets better. How many of y'all have learned and lived long enough to know that that does not happen? Amen. Unfortunately, even in the body of Christ, we many times folks have embraced that mentality and called it enlightenment or called it even love. And 
what happens is we become spiritual chamberlains. You guys remember who Neville Chamberlain was? There's a lot of history to you today. Neville Chamberlain was an uh, English diplomat, went to Germany to talk to Hitler prior to World War II, and he came back and said, no, these guys are all right. They, they ain't going to do nothing. And folks said, oh, okay. We know the rest of that story. See, God's way of dealing with sin is to accept our only source of help, and that's Christ. To recognize what he has done for us on the cross and, and receive that for ourselves. To repent of sin and to follow after him. And that is how we become free, and that's how we, we deal with sin. Now, for us today, how do we become a memorial? Have you all ever been to a war memorial? You ever, you ever seen the walls? Uh, they got the names... A couple of us have, all right. I've had the, the privilege of, of, of seeing, seeing those walls. And I want to under, us to understand something. In order for that to be effective, you've got to be touchable. You go up there and you see people just put their hands over somebody's name or they'll take a piece of paper and a pencil and they'll, they'll, they'll trace out the name. Because it's touchable. It's made to be touchable. It's not kept at a distance. And we as the body of Christ, we need to be touchable. We need not hold ourselves away from society. We need to have an influence into society. It doesn't mean that we go and we, we tell people how to live according to our standards. It means we tell people that there's a God in heaven who has a standard. And we need to live according to that. The message is clear. If you look at any of those memorials, uh, you, you don't sit back and go, I wonder what that says. No, the message is clear. And our message needs to be clear. We need to stick to the gospel. We need to stick to the word of God. We don't worry about our own traditions. We don't worry about church traditions. There's a lot of church tradition out there that has nothing to do with the Bible. Okay, And if we find ourselves holding on to something like that, we need to get rid of it. And the second, or the third thing is, is those memorials serve a purpose, and that is there's a commitment to keep the memory alive. That's why they make it out of granite and not out of paper mache or cardboard. Because it's made to endure time. We're in this for the long haul. We, as the body of Christ, are committed to keeping the gospel alive and forefront in society. Now, how does that work for us? Well, there's a, there's a couple ways that that works. It works by simply everywhere we go, that's part of what we do. I don't look for some organization to do it for me. I do it myself. So if I'm, if I'm at the store or I'm so, at a park or somewhere and someone starts having questions about the Lord, I say, hey, you know what? I can answer that for you. Maybe I'm at the store and they, I talk to people. Hey, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm not feeling good. Can I pray for you? Now? Yeah, now. Make it a short prayer. Don't make it a long prayer. Don't go through the book of Leviticus on them. You know, make it a short, <laughs> make it a short prayer because they got a job to do. All right? But you keep the gospel forefront. Okay? Being a living memorial is, is simple in what to do, but yet sometimes our, our hindrance uh, comes through our own sense of religion sometimes. We'll look at someone and say, well, you know what? They, they, that person can't be saved. Well, you don't know that. You don't know that at all. You might find that that person is prime uh, for salvation. Uh, years ago, we were, we were doing a street team up in uh, Hollywood, California. It's a little town down south. You've probably never heard of it. Um, a lot of weird stuff going on down there. And we got together. We, we sang some worship songs, and we were getting ready to hit the streets, and 
uh, as we're leaving this lot, these, these two guys come in and, I mean, they was mean looking. Black leather, spikes, the whole schmeal, dark sunglasses. It was like 11 o'clock at night and they're wearing sunglasses. It's like, I don't see no C&I dog. And, but they're trying to look mean and tough. And, and so thought was, well, these guys probably don't want nothing to do with this. But we don't know that. So we go, hey, how you doing, man? Can I talk to you for a minute? We started talking to them. Come to find out, they just got off the bus. They came from Georgia. They're playing dress up because they're in Hollywood. All right. And you know what? They gave their hearts to the Lord that night. Because you don't, you don't ever know. And you never want to judge folks based on their appearance. Okay. Um, over in Matthew 22 and verse 36. Uh, Jesus is being questioned by a, a lawyer, and he says, what's the, the great commandment of the law? He says, well, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your, your mind, and this is a great and foremost commandment. And the second one's like it. You love your neighbor as yourself, and on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Very little church stuff in there. Very little law. Very little regulation. In fact, it comes down to two things. You love God with everything in you, and then you love folks just like you, you love yourself. See, I have to ask myself, it, when I go to do something, is this going to please God? Because if I love God with everything in me, I have to ask that question. So if I'm going to cop an attitude towards someone, is that going to please God? If I'm going to engage in an activity, is this going to be pleasing to God? Everything throughout the New Testament we see time and time again that we have to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And we please Him because He is the Lord. The second thing is, do I want people to treat me this way? And I have to be honest about that. Because sometimes we say, yeah, I wouldn't mind if somebody treated me like that. Really? Oh, really? Be honest when you say something like that. See, the reason we need to be honest because sometimes we fool ourselves. Sometimes we try to fool others, but you know, you can never fool God. All right? Over Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Don't judge so that you won't be judged. For the same way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And he goes on to talk about some different things. In verse 12 it says, And everything therefore treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. So if I want, if I want to be loved, that means i got to love other folks. Let's pray if about I those things. If I want mercy, I need to be merciful. If I want grace, I need to have grace. If I want folks to be kind to me, I need to be kind to them. If I want people to tell me the truth, I need to be honest and not lie. And if I want salvation, I need to preach salvation. Okay. Now, with that thought in mind, I have to ask myself, do I want God to confront me when I sin so that I can repent or do I want God to pretend like it's okay to my own destruction? Well, I think the answer to that is, no, I, I do want God to confront me when I sin so that I can repent. I don't want him to say, oh, it's okay. We'll deal with this later at the lake of fire. No, I, I don't want that. I want God to deal with me today so I could avoid things like the lake of fire. Now, understand something. Confronting sin is not judging someone. Condemning someone is judging someone. But confronting sin is not judging someone, it's loving someone. Because many times God uses the body of Christ to confront the body of Christ. And there are times when a brother or sister will come to you and say, you know what? I need to talk to you about this. And the tendency at that time is to justify ourselves and say, oh, no, no, who are you to talk to me like that? 
Whereas the first question we need to ask ourselves is, is it true? And if it is true, then I need to swallow my pride and, and repent and get forgiveness. See, there's a whole lot at stake here. Not only for ourselves, but for those around us, those in our society. If we live in some pretty interesting times right now, it's really no, no better or worse than any other time in history, but it is different for us. And the body of Christ has to make a decision on what type of influence we want to have and how far we want to let things go. I believe that God is calling the church to a place of repentance for themselves, a place of boldness to speak the truth, okay? Because many times we wait for some organization to do what the body has been called to do. And we've found ourselves becoming more and more frustrated because things haven't been done. And they haven't been done only because we haven't done them. Okay? Um, with that thought in mind, though, when we do step out and we do uh, what the Word tells us to do, when we do uh, tell people that there is forgiveness that there is restoration, that there is healing. We find an anointing that comes upon us from God himself. And we find a joy that we can only experience through a life that is submitted in, in, in obedience to him. I have never, ever talked to anyone who has shared the gospel with someone who walked away and said, boy, that was such a terrible drag. I hated doing that. No, they all say, man, that was so great. I couldn't believe it. You know, they had these questions. I had this answer, and it was amazing. I don't know where that came from. But it came from the Holy Spirit. He's a pretty smart fellow. And he lives in you. And he wants to express himself through you. All right. Let's take a moment. Let's, let, let's pray about that. Because as we go on this weekend, especially in tomorrow, you're going to see that there are a lot of folks who this weekend is just nothing more than a long weekend to kick off the summer. It really doesn't mean a whole lot to them. And in the same way, you're going to talk to a lot of folks who the cross doesn't really mean a lot to them. They've heard stories about God. They've heard stories about uh, what that supposedly means. But most of what they believe is theirs. And they're just primed for somebody to come along who knows the truth to share it with them. All right? So, Lord, we ask that you would help us to be faithful. Help us to be, to be bold. Lord, we ask that you would give us the wisdom to identify when, when the doors open. And when, when you bring situations to us and, and you want us to uh, help someone... Give us the wisdom to identify that and to, and to step into it. Lord, we, we trust you, we love you, and we know that you're the only hope for this world. Help us to be bearers of that hope. Help us to be a city on a hill that's not hiding. Forgive us of the times when we've tried to hide ourselves and we've tried to, to live a life where no one notices uh, anything about us out of whatever reason. But help us to live our lives in such a way that people will find you in it and people will glorify you in it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.